Okay. Let me... All right. Welcome everyone um, to our special meeting for observership program uh, as part of a series of meetings that we'll be doing over the next uh, few months. Um, my name is Danish Bahati. I'm a movement disorders neurologist at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. I'm the director for the International Neurology Program, which includes the observership program. And as you guys know, with COVID, our in-person observership uh, stopped. So we um, created this kind of an introduction to neurology residency. So it's kind of a virtual observership, but not exactly. So there is no direct patient care that you can observe, uh, which is typically part of a regular observership. However, it does try to share a lot of resources for you to get familiar with neurology residency program, uh, which is the second part of an observership uh, or second role of an observership. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, invite uh, and have uh, with us Dr. Amy Hellman, who has kindly taken time out of a really, really busy schedule because July 1st is when the new residents come in. And I know she has been doing hours and hours of meeting with them to orient the new residents coming into our program. And despite that busy schedule, uh, thank you for taking the time out. Dr. Hellman uh, has been my mentor when I was a movement disorder fellow uh, at University of Nebraska Medical Center and has been a great friend since then. Dr. Hellman uh, is the director of our Huntington's Disease Center of Excellence, uh, a movement disorder neurologist, a partner in my crime, uh, and our uh, new program director for University of Nebraska Medical Center uh, Neurology Residency Program, uh, a really, really robust and growing program. Uh, by the way, my conflict is that I'm, an, I'm the curriculum director for that program, so of course I'm biased. I think we have the best curriculum. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Amy, for joining us, and, um, uh, and if you want to say anything else to everyone, please say hi. Yes, hi, everyone. Um, I'm happy to be here and uh, help in any way that I can. So thank you for inviting me. Wonderful. So what I've done is that I've asked the uh, uh, observers in their WhatsApp group to share, give me questions that they would like me to ask. Um, please keep your microphone uh, muted. If you have a question, you can type it in the chat box and I'll try to get to those questions. I, will do, I would give priority to those of you who are present here in person. So if you ask a question, uh, I will try to come to it first before continuing with the questions that I already have. Let's start with something very broad. You know, what in general, in a bird's eye view, what do you look for in a, in a candidate to invite for, for application or select for ranking? Yeah, I'll start with um, inviting for interview. You know, you want a, a, a good, solid, well-rounded um, application. Um, which means, sure, we want you to have good test scores, but we want to see consistency that, um, you know, you can score off the charts on your tests, but then if you're, you know, not performing well in your um, uh, rotations or, or, you know, throughout med school, um, you know, you're kind of just barely squeaking by, you know, we see a disconnect there, and, and we want to know that you're putting the work in your day-to-day -day, um, job and that you're not just you know, just doing the bare minimum. So again, seeing that solid, consistent performance, um, you know, things that can uh, really stand out and also well-rounded. So not just scores, not just grades, but also that you're, you know, have other interests and in activities, volunteer work, other things that, that show us that your interest and your, um, your passions, um, whether they be in medicine or somewhere else. Um, and, um, you know, what, what really goes a long way are the letters and kind of comments on the evaluations. So what people, you know, the people who know you, what they have to say about you, um, because that tells us, you know, you might look one, one way in person that doesn't, I mean, one way on paper that doesn't tell us what it's like to work with you day, day to day. Um, so if you have, you know, good, strong letters from people who can comment on your, your clinical skills, your work ethic, you know, what it's like to work with you. Um, you know, what your performance is like, again, th those things go a long way to, to really strengthening your, your application. Um, and then once, you know, during an interview, the things that, um, it, well, first, let me take a step back, you know, specifics beyond that is going to vary from, from um, uh, program to program, depending on what the program um, values more highly or, or the type of program, 
Um, you know, some want, want to see research or a certain amount of research or a certain amount of, of um, publications. Um, for others, it doesn't matter that much. Um, you know, we're one where we like to see that you've, you've shown some sort of uh, scholarly activity, um, but we don't have, you know, a, a requirement of a certain amount of, of research or, or anything like that. Um, and then when, when we have you um, here to interview, the things that we're looking for, again, are, you know, you're, we're trying to get to know you. So we want to see um, your interest and your passions. You know, neurology is not something that people do because they can't decide on, on you know, something else. It, it's, it's challenging. It's complex. So the people who do it, um, neurologists are very passionate about neurology. And we want to see that in our, our applicants. We want to see that your passion um, that's what's going to show us that it, having that passion is what's going to drive you to, um, you know, go in and work on your, your clinical, your neurologic exam so that you can be a better clinician. It's going to make you go in and, you know, research the rare disorders that we see to make sure you're taking good care of the patients. That's that passion is what's going to, um, you know, really drive you. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with, with the phrase, um, you, know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. It's very much like that in, in education and in training. We can give you all of the tools, but you're only going to grow and build if you use those. We can't, we can't do it for you. Um, and that's what we want to see. That's who we want to work with are the people who, who want to do that. Um, and so we look for those sorts of things, that, that, that passion, that interest, that motivation, um, that it tells us you're going to be putting in, again, putting in the effort, making our effort worth it and, and taking good care of your patients. So related to that, just high level question, um, you know, again, we're looking at bird's eye view, not specificities, but uh, are there some things that come to your mind which are red flags that bother you about an applicant or, or someone who is here for an interview, uh, especially something that the the applicants can actually avoid? Yeah, um, you know, things, um, you know, on an application, it, it, things that when, when there's a disconnect in the application, you know, something like, um, you know, a very, a very uh, uh, bland letter that basically says, you know, someone, you know, this person showed up and they did their job and they left and without really saying anything more about them, or even letters that basically just reiterate what's on your CV and don't really say anything else about you. It always kind of brings up a question of why that is, if this is somebody who you're working with closely, who you're choosing to write a letter for you. Um, um, you know, things um, like you know, uh, um, showing no interest in the interview. Um, if you know, we're, we're giving you an opportunity to ask questions and you have no questions. Um, that always makes me wonder why you're here and what, what, what's the point if you don't even, you know, care enough to ask questions. And I understand it gets to be a long day. You meet with a lot of people, ask the same questions to multiple people. That's okay. <laughs> you can, you, different people will have different answers and different opinions too. So you'll learn more by asking the same questions to other people. Um, you know, sometimes there's just, it, 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 one of the things too that can be a red flag is with our our um, residents when they do meet applicants. Sometimes they'll they'll you know even though it's it's separate from the the interview itself, but you know we have them meet and and interact with the the applicants. Um, we just ask if they see any red flags. So again, making sure that the the behavior when the faculty aren't around is is still professional and and appropriate, and that there's nothing that's coming up. Um, coming out that's concerning when, when they're kind of letting their, their guard down. So those are some of the things to avoid um, or to, that, that can create problems. Uh, very cool. Um, I'm going to try to now go in a little deeper and ask mm -hmm. some uh, questions, uh, which are different steps of, uh, of the process. So, uh, you know, one thing that we often wonder applicants, uh, especially that um, when you have so many applicants and there's only some that you can invite uh, or review, do you even have time to review every application and, uh, and how do you sort through them? And then how do you, is there a way to select, okay, let me just uh, enrich the pool 
uh, and and maybe select more from this pool rather than from everybody who has applied.